Um, well, good evening, everybody, and thank you very, very much for making the effort to come along for this presentation. Um, um, there's been a lot of talk about this project in the last year, and this presentation is needed to help our community understand what is being <coughs> proposed and what is happening at this point. Before introducing Deputy Mirfeld to speak, I would like to provide you with a little bit of background. Um, in October 2021, Deputy David Delisle um, was frustrated with how our government fails to explore revenue generation opportunities, emailed all deputies and suggested a meeting to discuss the development of renewables in a more entrepreneurial manner. Fifteen deputies met and formed three groups covering solar, tidal and wind power. And it was the wind group that Deputy Mirfeld and I joined which resulted in the proposal being presented today. The work of this independent group of deputies culminated in a comprehensive scoping report which was published on October the 18th of last year. And Deputy Mirfeld authored it following over 400 hours of research that was <laughs> mentioned many times of research, including consultations with the Crown Estates, UK and industry experts. The key recommendation of the scoping report was that because a strategic infrastructure initiative of this scale touches on so many policy areas, it is recommended that a cross-committee working group be established to take this forward. Policy and Resources announced the formation of a working group three months later in December 2022 to validate the findings of the scoping report, although not including the broad committee representation recommended. Due to attention being diverted to the first GST debate in January and February, the working group effectively started its work in March this year, but has made significant progress since then. Besides validating the facts and assumptions made in the scoping report, the working group has also engaged with companies who have approached the states expressing an interest in developing a utility-scale wind farm off Guernsey. And despite not marketing this initiative, five companies with well-established expertise in developing offshore wind farm projects have approached the states interested in this project. They can be categorised as either intermediaries capable of bringing the projects to market or end-to-end -end developers capable of developing this project from start to finish. Two companies fall into the intermediate category um, and the other three are end-to-end -end developers with assets valued in tens of billions of pounds. Following the June visit of Equinor, a potential end-to-end -end developer valued at 83 billion pounds, PNR finally recognised the potential of this project and instructed the working group to develop the project to specifically enable the signing of contracts before the 2025 elections. Four of the five companies have now met with the working group to discuss this project. They were very complimentary about the scoping report, authored by Deputy Meerfeld, and impressed with its insight. None of its original findings have ever been refuted or contradicted. Now, there has been a lot of speculation about the practicality and viability of a potential utility-scale wind farm off Guernsey, and this presentation will address and dispel some of the common misunderstandings and concerns. We hope those attending today will leave with an appreciation of how significant this opportunity is for Guernsey and the importance of pursuing it with some urgency. Finally, the front page headline in today's Jersey Evening Post reads, Wind Farm Vision for Jersey to be laid out. So Deputy Meerfeld and I, we are both are aware of Jersey's plans and Jersey was way behind Guernsey in exploring the potential for a utility-scale wind farm producing electricity for export. Guernsey is now falling behind Jersey and in danger of allowing them to take the initiative, as happens sadly all too often. So, I will now hand over to Deputy Carl Meerfeld to explain for what we have been working on for the last two years and, inten and, and more intensively for the last six months. I hand you over to Deputy Meerfeld. 
<laughs> thank you for that instruction, Chris. And for anybody who's interested in seeing the scoping report, this is it. And below it is some of the research I had to do to actually create that. Um, and that doesn't represent all of it. A lot of it was online. Anyway, hopefully the technology is going to behave so we can actually see a presentation. Um, so, the agenda I'm going to go through, if we can see it. I think it's, I don't know what's, uh, I think it's a cable issue. Yep, there we go, cable issue. Okay, the agenda. It could be a very long presentation. <laughs> Benefits to Guernsey. What I may do is read it off the screen and just hope the the, uh, the broadcast catch up, uh, the electronics catch up with me. Why Guernsey and why now? Common misunderstandings. Proposed approach, scope and revenue. Successful successes and failures and proposed way forward. So showing talking about what we've done so far. The ultimate objectives. And then I'll be taking questions for however long people want to ask them. Yeah, we're having a problem down there. Okay, so if I go back one, there's the uh, agenda. So, benefits. The all important one is raising revenue. At the end of the day, I will be detailing later this evening exactly the kind of money that is involved in these projects. Not just what the states can earn from them, but also how much they cost to develop and how they are financed. Obviously, a project like this is going to diversify and expand our economy. The states of Guernsey have spoken for decades about diversifying and expanding our economy, but has done very little to actually achieve it. Um, and if you look at the growth in the past, the introduction of the finance sector to Guernsey, etc., a lot of it has been private sector initiatives. The states here has an opportunity to facilitate, again, the private sector coming in to build a utility scale wind farm off Guernsey, uh, but w which would significantly impact our economy. And I'll go through that in more detail shortly. It's also going to create long term non finance related opportunities for employment. Um, the companies that visited us have told us that they would anticipate that requiring 200 full-time positions on Guernsey to maintain the websites will be that need a vessel put berth here and a warehouse for spare parts. They need sailors to man that vessel and they've already been, met with the harbour master to discuss, discuss the facilities and the facilities are there to cater for it and they would need engineers uh, because very much like uh, the fourth bridge where they maintain it by painting from one end and they move to the other and they start again at the other and they start again at the beginning the same thing with the wind farms they have maintenance crews that go out all the time they would be stationed in guernsey now my hope is those would be guernsey people they would be hiring or certainly over time guernsey people will be trained up to do the jobs because we're looking at the 60-year contract 200 jobs. If you look at that and scale it up to UK standards, that would be a case of a foreign company employing 200,000 people in the UK. That is significant. And the important thing is it's non-finance related. So we have an over-dependency on the finance industry now, both for our employment, our skills, and our revenue. This would create non-finance related jobs. The environment. Addressing climate change. Um, we have some states members or climate change deniers, but I think we all agree that there are problems and they have to be addressed. Everybody has a responsibility. Every individual, every company, every country, jurisdiction has a responsibility to do what they can to reduce carbon emissions. Because whether it's a natural cycle or not, the fact is we are contributing to that problem and we've got to reduce it. Now we would be looking here at a utility scale wind farm that wouldn't just address our own targets for a net zero, but would help the countries around us achieve that as well. Because we are looking at here, remember, I'm talking about a utility scale wind farm. So there's been there's been two wind farm, potential wind farm projects discussed by the states. One is part of the electricity <coughs> strategy, which is looking at 64 megawatts just to supply, or 60 megawatts just to supply Guernsey's needs. We would be paying either paying for that to be built or we're paying a high premium to get the electricity from it to finance it. What I'm talking about 
tonight is a utility scale wind farm producing the kind of level of power equivalent to a nuclear power station for export to England or France. So it has to be an export driven model, it has to be shipping that electricity out. Now Guernsey could participate in that by getting cheaper electricity for ourselves, but we would be consuming 64 to 96 megawatts depending on the time of year at our peak demand. We are looking, as I'll explain later, at a, 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 a wind farm that produces a lot more than that. It is going to help reduce carbon emissions, not just for us, but for neighbouring countries. If you're producing that much energy and you're not producing the carbon emissions that goes with it, then you are helping to reduce the burden massively disproportionately to the size of Guernsey, our economy and our population. Geopolitical. And this is one where also it starts changing the way that Guernsey is viewed by our neighbours and by other countries. At the present moment, I suspect that um, Westminster and Paris view us as, a, as um, something of a, at best an irrelevance and occasionally an annoyance somewhere in the middle of the channel. But if you get to a situation where we are through our wind farm being developed in our waters, doing two things. Exporting enough electricity to power six to eight million homes in England and France. And because we won't be building the wind farm itself in Guernsey, most likely location will be Cherbourg, putting billions of pounds worth of investment into France and possibly the south of England to actually build these wind turbines before they're shipped to Guernsey to be installed, then you have a different relationship. When you knock on those doors, you're no longer that annoying little neighbour who occasionally comes to irritate you. You are all suddenly, you're integrated into their economy. You are a serious player. You have a reason for them to speak to you. So it can actually change the status and the perception and the standing of Guernsey and its ability to get a hearing with our bigger neighbours and we'll position Guernsey again for our green finance industry, which is nascent, just starting in Guernsey, but looks extremely promising, and focuses like that. We could rebrand our island as truly a green jurisdiction. So it has all different aspects. So I would love to be able to show this picture, <laughs> if we can get it up. Ah, the joys. OK, what you will see if it flicks up eventually, is what they call a wind map. It shows the intensity of winds around our area. And what you'll see is the reason why somebody would build, want to build a wind farm in Guernsey is quite simply, we have the wind. There we go, beautiful. Okay, so Guernsey's up there, Jersey down here. On this scale, we as far as quality and strength and consistency of wind, we score a, a 9 out of 10. Jersey stands is about a 7. Why? You thought with proximity. Because the prevailing winds, for them, come over Brittany, and it's something called laminar flow. When the wind arrives at your turbine, you want it to be as pure and undisturbed as possible for you to extract the maximum energy. If it's turbulent, because it's passed over a land mass, then you do not get the same energy output. So Guernsey is in a prime location for picking up a good quality wind flow. And we are close to England and France for exporting. And yes, England. People said to me, oh, they would never run a cable all the way to England. I think they'll run several. Because A, the power, power we're talking about will take more than one cable. But Dogger Bank, the largest wind farm in the world, of which the company that um, uh, Visit does, and that uh, Deputy Blinn mentioned earlier, Equinor, our fourth uh, stakeholder, they've run cables 170 kilometres to England from the middle of the North Sea. So, yes, when you get a project on this scale, people run cables a very long way to sell that electricity. The other reason it, it, the opportunity is here, and it's here now, and it wasn't in the past. It's only in the last couple of years that technology has come onto the, uh, the state where they can actually utilise Guernsey waters. Because unlike Dogger Bank, which is typically about 30 metres deep, 
our waters are the high 40s through to about 60 plus that in the area we're looking at now we have just had going live in the last few days the evergreen development of scotland that's the deepest ever fixed installation which i'll point at the uh, the picture if we can actually get it back on the screen um it's what we call a jacket installation so it's fixed into the seabed on legs that's a cheap and easy installation that one there and they've just installed it at 58.7 meters so our kind of water depth if you can't do a jacket installation, you have to do a floating installation. Now, a floating installation means you're basically getting an oil rig platform and you're sticking a wind turbine <coughs> on it and then you're anchoring it on the seabed. That comes up about two and a half times as expensive to install for the same amount of energy. So your income's the same, but your cost of building is far higher. And then there's three different styles of those. You have the tensioned leg. That one doesn't work very well in Guernsey because it's got a 10 meter tidal range, so it's over tensioned at high tide and at low tide it falls over. You have the spar. Now these spars are actually over 70 meters long underwater, so it wouldn't work in Guernsey because it bounces along the bottom. So you end up with this one, the semi sub. That's the kind of installation. Effectively, it's like an oil rig platform over a wind turbine on top. Now, Equinor came to Guernsey, and one of the questions was, or one of our first questions, is our location commercially viable. They went away and did the numbers and they came back and said even in a worst case scenario your entire seabed's granite and we can't drill holes in it to put the jacket installation. Yeah. Yes, if we have to do floating installation at two and a half times the cost of installation your area of ocean is still commercially viable for us. And there we are, the two ugly mugs standing in front of a floating wind turbine. Uh, a few weeks ago, uh, Deputy Blinn and myself were invited up to uh, Scotland to visit one of these floating installations. And of course, the beauty of those is when you decommission them at the end of life, because any contract for a wind farm, one of the things you have to remember about wind farms, unlike nuclear power stations and even traditional power stations to some extent, they're a temporary structure. The contracts require them to remove everything and reinstate it at the end of the contract. Now, they would usually take everything away and recycle it. Uh, certainly the cables are about 30 cm across, uh, centimeters across and full of uh, and solid copper. They would want to recycle those and uh, a lot of value in them. The beauty of a floating one is, of course, you just literally up anchor and tow it away. So there are advantages from our perspective. In the area of ocean we've identified, um, the fishermen prefer the fixed installation because it actually creates a micro environment for crabs and lobsters to breed. We only have four Guernsey fishing boats of fish in the area we're looking at. This could still work for them, but then of course it makes it a bit more difficult laying their trots or pots. So, why? We have the wind. The technology has progressed to the point now where it can be done and it can be done commercially viably. Because at the end of the day, you're only going to get companies coming here if they're going to make money out of it. And there is great demand for locations for offshore wind farms at the moment. Timing is important. Because I'll be later on, I'll be describing the <coughs> round four of the Crown Estates auctions and the values they got for that auction and the fact that every country in the world is scrambling now having seen the revenue that UK has achieved trying to auction off bits of their seabed. We need to be at the front of that process not at the far end and I'm going to explain that there's a bottleneck in the industry coming that if we don't get in now come back in 2040 or 2050 and literally it will be a case that we will not be able to we won't be even looked at and the premium we get for our site will drop massively because it will be commoditized by then. So, other reasons why Guernsey. Guernsey can be flexible and we can expedite. One of the uh, complaints, there was, it was last year, the chairman of the two largest uh, wind farm development, Scandinavian wind farm development companies, stood up and made public announcements about how governments were slowing them down. 
the licensing processes, the uh, uh, various things that they had to hoops her to jump through because of bureaucracy. Now Guernsey starting this almost fresh, we'd be setting up a licensing commission. We have the laws in place already to do it. They just need enacting, they're already approved. Um, but we'd be starting from scratch. So we've already started a co practical conversation about how you can do the licensing at the same time as do the environmental impact studies and make the licensing conditional on the results. And various things could save years off the lead time for implementation. And because we're a jurisdiction, because we're coming at this new, uh, you, uh, you know, a standalone jurisdiction, because we're coming at it uh, from a new, we don't have existing legislation that binds us or procedures that bind us, we can be more flexible in how we do this. Also, unlike the UK, we're not going to continually be auctioning off sites. We're probably going to do one contract and that's it. So again, the way we approach it can be very different to other jurisdictions that incur, uh, have a lot more bureaucracy and a lot more uh, delays in getting um, things to market. And that comes down to my last point on there about being, this being time critical. This is time critical for several reasons. One, we have the demand now. In some ways, the Ukraine war has, has pushed uh, countries to look at renewables in a way that they weren't prioritizing previously because of wanting to reduce their dependency on Russia for oil and gas and be more independent, as well as the, obviously the green uh, uh, angles as well. They are desperate to do things now. You wait much longer and when there's lots of sites available, they're probably less going to be less, uh, uh, the companies are going to be less likely to look at a unique offering from a small jurisdiction like Guernsey if there's an ample supply of standard sites uh, that fit in a normal, uh, what they consider their regular model coming in from other jurisdictions. There's another reason why this is time critical as well. There's supply chain issues. Now, everybody's heard about supply chain issues. We've all seen some of them impacting our lives and seeing our prices going up. The prices of all of the wind farm equipment, etc., is going up. But that's not what I'm talking about, actually. I'm talking about the physical availability. What we've been told, what this research came up with, and what we've been told by the industry, is that unless you have your wind farm planned and your orders in for the equipment you need, because often this equipment takes three to five years to build, there, and unless those orders are on the order books by 2030, come back and talk to us in 2040 or 2050. Because the problem is, is because everybody now wants to do wind farms, you don't have the factories to build the turbines. So you might say, well, that's fine, get China to build a few more factories. Yes, but you don't have the ships to be able to tow them to location. You don't have the cable laying ships capable of putting the cables down. These are, getting, these are vessels that cost over £100,000 a day to rent, and they are being leased out years in advance. And for the European industry, the most concerning thing is America has finally woken up to wind energy. They are currently hiring all the expertise from Europe and massive salaries and shipping them over to America. And when America gears up on their scale and they start putting in their orders for equipment, then the whole of Europe will have trouble trying to get any of those ships, any of those turbines, any of those transformers. So there's a limited window. We need to be acting now. When I spoke to my contact at, at, um, at Crown Estates about this, I was uh, when that report was published a year ago, I said, I don't want Guernsey to miss the boat. His reply was, then you better paddle quickly. It's already leaving the harbour. Common misunderstandings about wind farms. Guernsey cannot afford to build a utility skills wind farm. That's correct. You'll see the values I, I, I put on what we potentially would have built here, and it's in the billions. Guernsey could never even think about building a wind farm financed by Guernsey. These projects are not financed by any one jurisdiction, one company. Dogger Bank, which I mentioned earlier, which I can always say owns 40% of, was financed by 42 different banks, raised the debt finance. So 42 banks around the world to raise the billions of pounds needed to build these 
projects. At Dogger Bank was £11 billion. Pounds. Cannot, Guernsey cannot consume all the electricity. Absolutely. The electricity strategy is looking for a small installation, maybe as few as four or five turbines, that would just supplement Guernsey's supply. We are talking about something here that we vastly larger than what we can consume. So it has to be an export-driven model. Now, we've had tentative conversations with both France and the UK. EDF in France, initial reaction, we'd like to buy 100% of what you produce. The feedback from the UK and the UK government is the something called CFDs, contracts for difference, is the way that governments subsidize uh, the production of electricity with 15-year contracts. Now, I've, because of my finance industry background, I can tell you we can, we can create a synthetic CFD through reinsurance, etc. So there is ways that Guernsey could do it. But the UK has actually said, if you'll plug the power into us, we'll consider including you in our CFD schemes and help underwrite your scheme. So there is, we know there's a market. We know people are desperate to get energy, and particularly from any source that doesn't involve Russian gas or fuel. So we don't have a problem finding somebody wishing want to buy it. Total tidal or solar energy. Energy is better. This is another objection I see on a regular basis. Solar energy, fine. You've got to have vast areas to be able to do it. And talk about running cables long distance. There was a there is talk of running a cable from England to Morocco to use the desert to collect solar panels. What you need is a vast area of land to lay out those solar panels to get utility scale production. If you're doing it for your house. No problem. If you're doing it for a small, a small amount of electricity, we can do it on Guernsey. And we should be doing it on Guernsey. We definitely should be putting more solar panels in on buildings and on houses. But it's not going to be our utility. We're not going to be exporting the electricity we produce from solar. Tidal. We'd love to have tidal. We are definitely going to be a major tidal energy center eventually. But the problem is it's just not commercially viable at the moment. So to give you an idea, the CFD, the guaranteed price for a 15-year contract, the cheapest it's got down to for offshore wind was £37.35 for per megawatt hour that they agreed that, uh, in fact it was Ecuador again, who did the contract with the UK government, they uh, got the lowest price, uh, the, the government achieved the lowest <coughs> price at their auction in the CFD some time ago before the Ukraine war. The CFD for Hinkley nuclear power station is £96.40 per megawatt, two and a half times the price, because that's how much extra subsidy is required to build a nuclear power station. Tidal was over 280 It's really certainly fallen to around £220 per megawatt. So you can see, to subsidise Tidal, you're having to pay over eight times the amount for the electricity you can get from wind. And um, what was the other point I was going to make at this stage? Uh, the so yes, the CFD is on that. Do, oh, that was I was going to put it in perspective from a Guernsey perspective. How much are we paying for our electricity from EDF wholesale? We are currently paying an average of around 110 pounds per megawatt. That's what we're paying for us today on forward fixed contracts that start expiring next year. I expect that price to go up rather dramatically. So, Equinor are selling government power from wind to the government at £37.35. Nuclear, they're having to subsidise Hinkley C at £96.40. We're paying £110, but if you want power from Tidal, it's £220. So that's why Tidal is not ready yet. It will happen, just like if you went back five, six years ago, they'd say, Guernsey's water's too deep, we cannot build a wind farm there. Things are changing all the time, and eventually, Guernsey, and particularly Oldney, will be fantastic centres for tidal, but it isn't there yet. And when it is there, I hope we're one of the first people to jump on it and do it. Wind farms are bad for the environment. I, I, I always kind of struggle with this one. I, I saw some feedback on the internet saying, oh, a wind farm requires, uh, you know, 900 litres of lubricating oil over a six-month period. I'm going, well, okay, well, how much power diesel do you put in for one of our generators to get the power over that time period? You know, people are worried about uh, all the environmental angles. So, so, for instance, recycling of wind farms. Until recently, 
you could recycle virtually all of the wind turbine except for the blades. And these blades are up to 106 meters long. As of now, we have a company in America that started recycling blades. So and I think certainly if we did a wind farm, you'd be looking at a 60 year contract is standard, is two life cycles for the turbine. So a 50 to 60 year contract where they expect to change the turbines after about 25 to 30 years. I'm sure that by the time we get to 30 years, they'll be recycling virtually all of those turbines. Uh, but even so, you look at to produce concrete. Most concrete, the biggest concrete manufacturer, cement manufacturer is Blue Circle in Thailand. The amount of energy required to produce concrete. All that concrete they poured in, poured in nuclear power stations. None of it is uh, particularly green, but unfortunately that is a cost for our society if we want to carry on powering our mobile phones and our laptops. But as far as the environment is concerned, wind is extremely good. And as I say, it's a temporary fixture. Unlike a nuclear power station where you really can't remove all that radioactive concrete at the end of its life, with the wind farms, the contract stipulates they've got to return the area to its original position. Now, the likelihood is, of course, there'll be another contract and somebody else will put new equipment in. But that's the way it's done. And certainly with floating wind turbines, you'd literally up anchor and just tow it away. Guernsey will not, uh, cannot see revenue for many years. Again, a misconception. The, you, the way that the UK Crown Estates works is they, do, they auction off an exclusive option to explore will, building a wind farm. That means companies are bidding to have an exclusive option and they pay an option fee. That option fee is paid from the first day that they get that agreement, typically a seven year option. They pay an annual option fee just to explore building a wind farm. Then when they make what they call a final investment decision, they convert the option into a contract. And it's a pre-production contract, which then they're paying for the lease on the seabed, which is often the option fee converted, and a percentage of the assumed production of the wind farm, which by now has been designed. Then when it actually goes into production, they pay you a percentage of the production of the power and the lease for the entire 50, 60 year term of the contract. And even in the decommissioning phase, they're still paying those lease payments. So you can actually start getting payments just when the companies, you've given them an exclusive right to look at exploring building a wind farm. When they're in the research and planning phase, you are earning revenue. And we're not talking about small amounts of revenue. So, Crown Escape's UK model. As I say, they typically go out and they will identify a piece of ocean, a seabed, and they will go through and they'll spend 20 to 30 million pounds on doing research. You know, tidal currents, geology, ge uh, um, uh, the banthic species, there's a list of research they have to do on, on that site. And they package it up for auction. Now, from day one, our working group knew there was no way that Guernsey's stopping up 10, 20 million to do research on our seabed to package it for sale. So, again, you'd have to look ver a varying from the UK model because also it takes a long time to bring to market if you're doing all that research in advance. Other models, different countries do this in different ways. So the UK does this auction now. Scotland actually does it differently. They have a different model where it's a, a beauty pageant. Uh, they have a qualitative, ass qualitative assessment of, the, of um, wh what they think will be the best developer for the site. And they have requirements like 50% of the wind farm has to be built in Scotland. So now they have an issue that the wind farms are not getting built because they don't have enough facilities in Scotland to build them. If you go to somewhere like Holland, Rotterdam, they recently did an auction, round seven, and they said, we basically got enough money. Uh, we want the companies to bid to put in technology for us. We want you to put in a smart grid for us, charging points, all the software to run in our smart grid, uh, and, uh, and a storage, of battery storage, etc. So the bid from uh, BP was to put it, to get in return for a win from half the size of what we're, um, we are potentially looking at. They were uh, going to invest two billion euros in infrastructure in Rotterdam. So there's different ways we can look at. Recommend approach for Guernsey. 
from our perspective, if we want to avoid having to invest and take several years of doing research, which again, we're not even well equipped to organize that research, let alone to actually conduct it, nor do we want to put tens of millions of speculative money in, then we want to step back and say, well, okay, we'll accept a lower release on our, our seabed, but we want to get the companies to take on that risk and do it for us. And in return, because they're taking more risk, they'll be paying us less. And also, how do you value the seabed if you haven't done the research? You don't know what the cost of installation is. You don't know if it's floating or it's a uh, jacket installation. What you do is follow the Danish model. What the Danish are now doing is they are taking 20% equity in the wind farm and then saying, well, now we'll run an auction and you give us a price for the lease, you compete on how much you'll pay for the lease on top of giving us 20% equity. Now to one of the companies, actually the company that took us to Scotland uh, to look at their floating wind farm, they bought 20% of the Dogger Bank uh, last year. And as I say, it, it was a, a setup cost, it was pre-production purchase of 20% of Dogger, a Dogger Bank. And they haven't divulged how much they paid, but since it cost 11, million pound, a, a million, a seven, oh, sorry, 11 billion pounds to build, it would have been several billion pounds to buy 20% stake pre-production because it's de-risked by then. So you're looking at an equity stake in a wind farm on this kind of scale, and we are looking at something like a Dogger Bank scale worth billions of pounds to Guernsey, and then Guernsey having the investment return from that on top of a lease which I would hope to see in the tens of millions, if not higher. So, similar lease structure in the UK is what we're looking, uh, we, we, we've explored as part of the working group. Uh, we've identified an area off Guernsey of around a thousand square kilometers. And that's out from five miles out to 12. And so it's this kind of area but now expand, extends around the top a little bit as well because Albany also want to be involved in this project. So it comes out about 1,000 square kilometers of seabed. Now, Chris and I have seen these turbines at, uh, up close and personal and out at five and six miles. Up close and personal, they are huge. At five miles, they're not so big. They're not so intrusive. Each person will have their own opinion on that, but that's a conversation for another day. So, we've identified about 1,000 square feet. We're looking at a similar lease structure to the UK. So, our seabed, like the UK seabed, is actually owned by the Crown. So, His Majesty owns the seabed. Ours from three miles out to 12, same in the UK. The only difference between Guernsey and the UK is, under a 1948 agreement, we get 100% of the revenue, whereas the UK only gets 75%. So 100% of the net revenue, so they take out their expenses for processing it, but then we get 100% of the net revenue. So it would be a similar structure to the UK, and the size of wind farm we're looking at is 1,500. Within that 1,000 square kilometers, you can do 1,500 to, th uh, to 3,000 megawatts. Remember, Guernsey's con is consumption. 64 peak in summer, 96 peak in winter. We're talking about 30 times what we can consume at peak. Flamanville Nuclear Power Station has two reactors. Each one is 1.3 gigawatts, 1,300 megawatts. In total, it's 2,600. Hinkley C Power Station is a 3,000 megawatt nuclear power station at projected to cost 28.6 billion pounds. Hence, it needs 96 pounds 40 as a CFD to finance it. So we're not talking about a small project here. And Crown Estates gave us an estimate of five to nine billion pounds to build this wind farm off Guernsey. But again, Guernsey's not going to be paying for that. That's going to be inward investment into Guernsey from outside, <coughs> from a huge syndicate of international banks. And again, it won't be even be us negotiating or organizing that. The developer will. So potential revenues. I mentioned the Crown Estates auctions. These are from uh, February the 8th, 2002. 1,500 megawatts, 500 square kilometers. Annual payment before GST. Oh, sorry, between, no, 
a Freudian slip before VAT. VAT, they have 20% add on that. They have to deposit that in an escrow account when they submit their bid. When they're told they're the successful winner of that bid, that money gets taken out. And next year, it gets sent a bill for the same amount again. And that is not rent for the lease bed. That is a payment for a non-refundable payment for an option to explore building a wind farm. Now, Guernsey won't get that amount. Why? Things have changed. Supply chain issues, the cost of the turbines and all the equipment has gone up dramatically. Interest rates have risen dramatically. We now have some of the people who won these auctions actually saying, we're cancelling our auction, if you give our first or second year premiums, we're walking away, because it's not commercially viable anymore. So, just because of the mechanics in the market, this value will drop for Guernsey perspective. Also, Guernsey is not it's dog a bank. It's not 30, me uh, 30 meters of nice, calm, well, it's not calm water out there, nice uh, water with low currents and low uh, tidal ranges. We have uh, other issues technically here, so we will not get that premium. But even if we got a quarter of it, yeah, 50, 60 million pounds a year as an option fee, that would be kind of rather handy. So, what, we, the, what the working group has been recommending to PNR and exploring is a different approach. So, the, more like the Danish model. We go out to the developers and we say, we're not going to pay for the research. We're not going to do all of that. We want you to take that risk. We want an equity stake and we'll get you to compete on what lease you will pay on top of that equity stake. So again, the equity value drops again because you are asking for equity and you've been paying partly in equity, not in fees. Now, to give you an idea of how keen these companies are, of the five companies we've had conversations with, two of them have made invest, uh, offers to invest millions of pounds in doing the research for us. One of them wants an exclusive option in return because, of course, it's worth a lot more. They can flip that. The other one said, we'll do it at our own risk. This is a multi-billion pound company worth tens of billions. We'll do the research at our own risk. 2.4 million. We want to do birds and mammals, and we want to start in September last month. They sent us a proposal. We want to start the research. We'll do it at our own risk. We'll organize it for you because we want to expedite this project. Uh, project. And you've got to start the research before October because October is the bird migration and you've got to have two sets of October data, two years of data. And they were willing to do that, and they simply said, if you give the project to somebody else at the end, we'd want to be reimbursed. So obviously, if we gave the project to somebody else, we'd say to that company, you've got to pay them back, not Guernsey. Unfortunately, with various distractions, we haven't got around to replying to the offer yet, so we've missed that opportunity, which will push the overall development of a wind farm in Guernsey back by 12 months. This is why I'm saying time is critical and dedicating the resources, focusing on this, getting it done is so important. But we have companies willing to put up millions of pounds of their own money at their own risk to start doing the research. They are desperately keen to proceed with this. Guernsey just needs to get out of the way and start facilitating instead of unfortunately being the same old bureaucratic Guernsey who doesn't look at things like this. Because, and this is a reaction I've had from the public Oh, that's unbelievable. The numbers don't make sense. And it is. It almost so faces you when you start talking about billions of pounds. How could billions of pounds in Guernsey be included in the same sentence? Well, you'd be surprised at how many billions of pounds are already here in the finance industry. But this is real. This is happening all around the world. And we have a massive opportunity. We just need to seize it. So the PRDAR working group, of which I chaired until recently and which now Deputy Blinn is chairing, Successes and failures. Um, it's validated the original scoping report. The people who came to visit Guernsey were actually very, very complimentary about that. Now, my background is as managing director, chairman of investment research companies, big international ones. I ran the Asian operations for th the three world, world's three largest um, fund research companies. Uh, Micropal, which is now a subsidiary of Standard & Poor's, Lipper Analytical Services, which is now a subsidiary of Reuters, and Morningstar, which is listed on the Nasdaq Stock Exchange. And I ran the North American operations for Micropal as well. 
So I, and I used to work as a consultant doing things like this as well, producing reports. So I've done a deep dive on it and come up with this report and it's been received very, very well. But we, I, I, I said, when the, in the back of this report, it said PR needs to put together a working group to validate this and make sure I've got it all right. Well, that validation has been done. Nobody has contradicted any of the findings or the information provided in there. And as I say, the people who've come to talk to us are very, very complimentary about it. We had discussions, as we've described, with um, major players. We're talking about companies. When you talk about a company with 83 billion pounds market value, that's the equivalent of the entire GDP of Guernsey combined for the last 30 years. It's probably the combined ag aggregate revenue of the states of Guernsey for the last 100 years. This is on a scale that, you know, it, it's hard to imagine when you think about it. And, we, and they are not the largest. We've had bigger companies, much bigger companies, come talk to us. Uh, we've determined the direction of travel in that we should be looking at this kind of equity lease fee split and making sure that the companies take the risk on the exploration and accepting we'll get a lower premium for that because we're not investing up front to de-risk it. They are taking the risk. But still, there should be more than enough money left over in the pot to keep us, well, happy for a very long time. So, proposed way forward. What we, what Deputy uh, Blinn and myself, what I'm proposing to the states now is that we set up a separate working group because the, the, I think from my perspective, the frustration has been that this project gets subjugated to other political interests and uh, hasn't been properly as well resourced. We could have been further ahead. If I was in the private sector doing this, I'd be six months further ahead we'd be at the point of now having a, a, a deal designed and be taking it to market. Whereas we haven't even hired the consultants yet that the Crown Estates recommended. We, they introduced us to their lawyers and their agents that take their deals to, uh, the, to, to the market. And that's four months ago. We were given their names and referred to them. We haven't got around to producing an RFP, a re request for a proposal yet, to actually contact them and ask them to tell us how much it's going to cost for us to do, their work, uh, to, to do the work for us. In the private sector, this would have been done so much faster. So there is a, an amendment coming to the states this week that will be looking to set up a working group with Deputy Blinn and myself heading it up, but this time reporting back to the assembly every quarter and the public so you, everybody knows what's happening, and specifically saying that a policy letter has to be produced by the end of next year on what we want to do with the wind farms, because I believe it's possible to structure a deal and get it signed up potentially before the end of this term in 18 months time and once you sign that deal those checks start rolling now there's a lot of caveats to that there's a lot of things that have to be done but if we put our minds to it we can every other country is doing it and we have the ability to actually jump through a lot uh, j uh, avoid a lot of the pitfalls that they have fallen into in the process of doing it uh, there needs to be further engagement with stakeholders. This kind of new working group would go forward, and it's something that has to be done the whole way through the project. You have to engage with people. You have to give them visualizations of what these things would look like off the coast so they can see for themselves what it's going to look like. You have to speak to people like the fishermen who may be directly impacted. You want to talk to the, or, or the environmental organizations. Now, all of them, I ha it, you know, or we have contacted them already and spoken to them. Um, uh, in fact, when that report was first published, we did. Uh, but it needs that we need to increase that engagement because at the end of the day what you don't want is a public backlash and a project that could be so good for the island derailed because you haven't engaged with stakeholders properly it's, it, engaging the experts in, uh, to develop a deal crown estates came to us and said here's the three agents that we use to structure our deals and take them to market here's the top people in each one of them go call them that was four months ago we need to get on with that and bring a policy letter, as I say, back to the states by the end of 2024 so that within a year, the island knows what direction we're heading with, heading in. And we can go back to the industry and say we now have an official decision one way or another. It may be that and 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 and. and uh, Deputy Furbrush is in the front seat. He, he would agree. You can come to the states with proposals. And, and it, they can be sound proposals, but if the public don't want them or the majority of Japanese don't want them, they're not going anywhere. But at least we'd have an answer on something like this. We would have an answer within 
15 months. So, ultimate objectives. Raise significant revenue, expand and diversify the economy, plus create long-term non-finance related employment opportunities on Guernsey. And I personally think that's a very important one. We need to try and reduce our dependency. We don't want to undermine the finance industry, but we want to reduce our dependency because all our eggs are very much in one basket. Addressing climate change and helping Guernsey achieve its uh, zero carbon objectives, but also helping our neighbours achieve theirs. Establish Guernsey as an exporter of clean en energy and enhance our geopolitical standing and influence with neighbouring countries. So as I said at the start, this would change the whole way that Guernsey is perceived. All of a sudden we're not a, a, an irrelevance or an irritation. We are the jurisdiction who's providing billions of pounds of investment into Cherbourg to build these turbines and ship them down to Guernsey. We're the jurisdiction who's powering six million homes in the south of England. And with that, I've gone on longer than I expected. My apologies for that, but I will now take questions. And, and uh, 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 Chris, if you'd like to step up and take questions. <laughs> David. I thought I had a monopoly on those. Uh, okay, who would like to ask, ask a question? I'm open to be challenged on anything. Sorry, uh, we'll go with, yeah. Oh. Uh, I'm Gordon Young, by the way. Um, thank you very much, uh, Deputy Muriel, for the way you put things over, and you've explained things quite well. But. When I go out for a pint on a Saturday, this talk about wind farms and everything else that uh, the state talks about is all a load of rubbish to a lot of people because they don't understand what it's like to be poor or have to work for money. They don't understand where that money comes from in the first place. So therefore I say, let's go ahead with this uh, with farm uh, that you, you're proposing, but we, I think it's been going on for the last 20 or 30 years that it's been talked about. But when you, you, you go to the management or the, uh, whoever's in charge of the state's electricity board, they seem to run you down. They don't want to know nothing. And mm -hmm. I think they should be put in their place and realize that it's time that Guernsey woke up and went forward not backwards, we're 100 years behind that time. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you, Gordon. Um, it, 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 uh, I must admit, uh, being a bit behind the times is always an attraction to me for Guernsey. I'd rather be a bit more conservative. I'd rather be a bit more, uh, I, uh, a little less influenced by America. Uh, I like our society here. But going back to your point about uh, being talked about for a long time, you're right. The States of Guernsey had a working group looking at tidal energy 10, 15 years ago, and the technologies, 2014, as Chris has just reminded me. Uh, 2014, there was a, a, a group working on, on tidal for Guernsey, and, and a decade later, it's still not here. It, the technology's not here. And as I said at the start, if you'd have looked at this wind farm project for Guernsey five years ago, four years ago, the industry would have turned around to you and said, no, nope, your water's too deep. We can't do it. Things have changed in just the last two or three years when you've got floating wind farms now in existence and growing all the time, and you've got installation of jacket in nearly 60 meters. That is game changers from our perspective because that is our water depths. So it's starting to become commercially viable. And the man in the pub doesn't understand this, and it does sound pie in the sky when you start looking at these numbers, but this is real. I'll stake my personal and political reputation on it that this is real and it's deliverable and it can be done relatively quickly if we focus on it. Can I add something? Yes. And, and just to add, we recently had a visit down to Saint-Brieuc, um, to the wind farm down there, 
Now, they've been going through this whole process. It's nearly 12 years from the surveys, the plans, the government intervention, uh, you know, all of those factors there. And by the time which they're building and completing right now as we speak, those turbines are something like eight uh, megawatts a turbine, whereas the ones we've been looking at, technology and progress has gone on, we'll be looking at 15, and therefore less pylons, less turbines. So that technology, but until you make that decision, you can't go ahead and fulfill. So it's all about setting the, 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 the stake in the sand, making the decision, as you're saying, Gordon, to get on with uh, um, a proceeding to, to make this work. Sorry, the gentleman at the back there. Yeah, thanks. Um, I can speak from a position of being very enthusiastic on uh, renewable generation and so on. Wind generation is just one of those assets. Um, and over the last year, my own impression is you played pretty fast and loose with some big numbers and uh, engendered heightened expectations amongst many people in this room and possibly the islands as well by making some what I believe to be relatively unrealistic claims in terms of subsidisation of electricity prices, installation of heat pumps. Uh, you've said bizarre things in terms of our relationship with the French, uh, in terms of uh, uh, other, um, in, in terms of uh, uh, the risks, uh, political risks, um, in, in which, would, which may, uh, which may uh, result um, from us not being able to export uh, uh, electricity and so on. But um, just by way of perspective, I just wonder if you'd like to tell the room what the uh, net returns were for the latest UK wind farm auction, which happened about uh, a month or so ago. Certainly. Before I do, though, I... Uh, right. The, um, uh, but first, uh, first of all, I'll say I'm very happy to say, uh, stand up and, uh, and uh, uh, be accountable for what I have said, but I won't... Uh, I, I, I didn't say all of that. I certainly haven't discussed heat pumps and, and subsidising those, so... I don't think I've ever spoken about heat pumps. Mm, not sure it's me. Well, you better go and read it again. Anyway, uh, yes, the latest, the latest, uh, you're talking about the latest CFD auction or the one for... CFDs are, in a place like Guernsey, are an inappropriate way of managing um, electricity prices. They're typically, in, it wouldn't work in an environment like this unless you've got an enormous balance sheet, um, which Guernsey doesn't have. Um, and likewise, CFDs are typically only operate on a, on a, on a one-time payment basis. And I, I remain sceptical. Right. Well, the latest CFD auction was uh, was failed. It didn't get any bidders at all. But that's because the UK government put out a uh, auction requiring bids at forty four pounds per megawatt hour or less, and the industry quite simply turned around. We can't supply electricity at that price under these current market conditions for the next fifteen years. So nobody nobody bid. Because, again, if you come back to Guernsey, we're paying £110 per megawatt and the price is going to go up next year. Um, so, yes, there have been uh, hiccups in the UK auction markets, particularly CFDs, and it was falsely reported by the media as being a failure of interest in wind farms. That's not a failure of interest in wind farms. That's a failure of, of, of commercial entities not wanting to sell things at a loss. Uh, and and just means that those projects will go ahead and they will sell in the open market at whatever the retail price is. It's also worth mentioning the CFDs. As you say, Guernsey could, there is a way you can create a, a, a CFD through reinsurance, etc. But the UK is offered to potentially include us in their CFD scheme if we take the electricity to them. They're that keen to take it. Um, then there's another auction. The, uh, round five of the uh, 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 the seabed auction for um, the UK was announced. The results were announced on the 11th of September, and there was no bids for the offshore section, the offshore wind. Reason being, they told them that they could bid on the seabed, they could buy their options and pay their fortune, uh, the uh, fortune for them, but they couldn't have a grid connection to to land the electricity on shore till 2030 at the earliest so the industry said well i tell you what we don't fancy paying 10 years of option fees and all the rest of it when you're telling us and you can't even necessarily guarantee it's going to be 2030 it could be the 2030s so that's why that round did not get bids on the celtic sea because they literally the, the uk government told them you cannot have a a a, a grid connection until 2030 plus
Now, in Guernsey, we'd have to look to move that power to France or England. Now, France, we know that towards Flamanville, we have a nuclear power station there. They have that kind of grid. Because one of the powers, when you start talking about this amount of power, it's not like plugging an extension cable in. You have a serious problem where you land it and how you handle it. So, um, France, we know, got decent connection at uh, Flamanville and Cherbourg because they've got two nuclear power stations there. You've also got a massive ring main that effectively goes down the south of England, which they're desperate to get power into, because one of the problems with renewables is generally, A, they're intermittent, that's why you need a nuclear power station as well to fill in the gaps, but also, usually the power is generated a long way away from where you want to consume it. If you've got a big diesel generator, you can stick it down in St. Sampson's and turn it on when you need it. But with often with wind farms, and especially large scale utility scale ones, they're going to be many, many miles, hundreds of miles away from where the populated centers where you actually need the electricity. So you've got to have a way of landing it and taking it in. Now, the south end coast of England has a massive electrical pipe running down it, basically, but no wind farms plugged in. So they're very, the UK is very, very keen to take power in England. That means running cables over 100 miles. But as I say, Dogger Bank was 170. So the companies are willing to do it. Um, uh, Rupert, just um, we have spoken with a number of developers, and they all have a different angle, and they're all vying for the opportunity to look at this. So when we get to the point well, from an RFP, we have the consultants working with us to to look at those options. That's when the real negotiation goes on. So you are absolutely correct that with interest rates, with costs, with timing, and just to give you a sort of a, a, a side example, when we were visiting Saint Brieuc. Um, we then spoke to Iberdrola, who is actually the developer there, and they showed us the map going right past the Channel Islands and right up the coast of France, where they've got all these um, projects lined up and planned, and they're developing them. And, and now, possibly, Jersey will fit in in the other slot there. So it's not just one developer. It's multiple developers negotiating correctly, so as you say, to make sure it works for them. But you are still looking, whether it be at the prices we saw from the Crown Estates or if it's another price. And, and as Carl correctly said, let's not expect one of those large figures, but still a quarter of one of those figures is still interesting for an island of 65,000 people or less than 65,000 people with the potential of the revenue gives us. Yeah, uh, I think it's, no, it's also... The, the, Well, I, again, uh, tonight's presentation is about wind farms, but also the numbers I presented tonight, none of those were created by me. The five to nine billion pound estimate for the cost of building a wind farm was provided by Crown Estates. The auction values are the published returns of Crown Estates. And I've said through this evening, as Chris has pointed out, that we will not get that. It will be much lower than that because of the interest rates increasing, the supply chain costs increasing, and the difficulties in our waters. But we have companies worth tens of billions of pounds turning up to Guernsey, desperately keen to pursue this project, offering to write out checks out of their own pocket at their own risk to start the research right now. Now, all I want to do is pursue this to the point where we can sit down and start talking about what offers, what money they're willing to really put on the table. I don't know. 
but I'd certainly like to find out. So, yep, Dr. Sloan. So, um, Dr. Sloan, okay, so, so that's the correct process, you, you, you know, you'd consider that we have to scope all that. What, what we were tasked to do was to investigate and to look into all the areas, and we've engaged. So we've, in effect, been courting the various developers to see all this. The stages we have to get to, as each of them has shown and expressed an interest in doing it, that's at that stage we can do that. because. Our, we can't calculate what they're willing to do until we have the opportunity to negotiate. Well, I suppose what I thought was that it was scoping out to understand the value to us of what this opportunity Base, is. Really yeah. tolerance is the the nearest we can do is base it off the figures of Crown Estate and equivalents or the Danish model and others. Well, more specifically, it, uh, Crown Estates gave us the senior management's name for three agents, companies, consultants that they use to take their, to value their projects, to package them and take them to market. And uh, we're waiting to send out an RFP to engage those people. Those are the people with the real expertise in the industry who will run those numbers and will tell us what the end value is. What we've done is been able to identify there is a real opportunity here. There's market interest without us. You remember, we haven't marketed this project. This is people reading about that report being published in the paper and coming to us. We haven't gone out to the market. Iberdrola, we met them. That's a national electricity provider for Spain. Uh, we met them uh, in Sibria. Oh, did I get the pronunciation right? He's always correcting my pronunciations. Um, we, we met them at, in Sibria, and uh, they are interested. Great. but. We haven't even gone to market. We have not put an ad in the paper saying, please come to Guernsey and invest in our wind farm. We're not at that stage yet. We need no, to get those experts in. I just thought yeah. thinking would have been, you know, time for that, that sort of... It's a, the that reference of the, the work we were doing is identifying and finding. I'll, I'll to give you another example, Andy, as well, is with Iberdrola um, over there, the conversations we were having with the senior executives of Iberdrola and the Poifir, the, the prefect from Paris, who is the representative of Macron who has to make sure that the whole process is, is followed. They've done this for 12 years. They are totally open to share that information of the, the hiccups, the benefits, the things they could have done differently. And we have that almost on our doorstep of a, a wind farm which is now actually being built now. So we have not only the opportunity, but we have the, the expertise and the history to follow through to ensure that we can actually better that or improve that. Thank you. Anybody else? Sure. Yep, please. Dave, oh yes, sir. Correct me if I'm wrong, but you, I think you said there's, uh, they were generating 1,500 and 3,000 uh, megawatts. And Guernsey requires 64. Correct. 64 megawatts? Yeah. Yep. So, the public that right. No, no <laughs> I, <think laughs> I certainly know. wouldn't. Right. So the kind of deal you can structure, or the kind of thing we we are exploring, is, for instance, went to EDF and they said, we don't want to you to top slice and take off 100 megawatts and then send us the rest. Just land 100 percent on us, and we will supply you what electricity you need back, and we'll load balance it with our nuclear, so that you don't have to worry about when the wind's not blowing. What we can do with them is go and say, right, you're buying it for 50 pounds per megawatt from the wind farm, whatever the agreed price is. We'll buy it back at, from you at 60 or 70. They've got a markup, but we know we are getting not the wholesaler's price at 110. We are getting the producer's price plus a markup, 
and then getting it supplied back to us and they're handling the load balancing. Because again, you wouldn't want to necessarily land 3000 megawatts on Guernsey before sending it somewhere else. Because you're talking about the transformers, uh, transformers and the sa substations are massive. Right, so I get, I get all that. Yeah. Uh, but, but, you, well. but you're right. I've won you, that as well. Mm. In terms of getting the public buy in, you can easily sign up the right length of contract and then also have that, a huge that, chunk of it. That, that, that's exactly the kind of thing you'd be looking to do. You'd be wanting to lock in cheap electricity prices for the population of Guernsey for the next 60 years for the life of the contract, linked into whoever's buying it, uh, selling some of it back to you at a, at a price, not at the wholesale price, but at a supplier plus price. Well, hopefully not. Um, yeah, we seem to be talking about finance. What about the practicalities of these generators? If you're talking about 15 megawatt turbines, they're massive. If you've got them off the southwest coast in sunset, you're going to have tremendous flicker across the island um, as the clouds <coughs> flick across the sun. Um, where I lived in England, we had wind turbines all the way around us, and it was very, very irritating. What distance? But, um, you haven't mentioned the practicalities about substation, how you bring, where you're bringing the cable, uh, what size land you <coughs> how well is all that going to be organised? It, uh, it seems to all glossed over at the moment. What? I think you need to well, tell the people of Guernsey practically what it's going to be like right. and what's needed. The uh, and this is why two different committees were looking at this. We had ENI, the Environment and Infrastructure Committee, looking at the domestic 64 to 96 megawatts and coming up with a small number of turbines, what they call near shore, within two or three miles offshore. What our group's been looking at is a utility scale one, where it's an export model, you're exporting the power way past anything we can consume. And it's five, six, out to 12 miles out. So you're looking much further out, much deeper water. And in all probability, you would you quite possibly wouldn't land any of the power on Guernsey because of the fact you have to build. And so for these offshore wind farms, they put substations on an, on an oil rig platform next to the turbines and the power would go directly to France or the UK. And when we would get supplied through, for instance, the environment and infrastructure proposed putting another cable into France, that cable would then supply the electricity back to us. There are other ways some of these companies that come to us have talked about how they are electrifying the oil rigs and decarboning the oil rigs, it's kind of ironic, uh, in the North Sea, because each of these oil rigs has a 20 to 25 megawatt generator on board to power the oil rig. And they're putting in a wind farm and then having a hub and spoke type arrangement where they, when the wind's blowing, the wind farm supplies actually the building wind farm three times larger than the area, all of the oil rigs in the area require uh, because of power factoring but they supply all the power when the wind's blowing. And when they're not, they take the cable that's uh, connected to the mainland and they take the power, they take excess, they sell it when the wind's blowing. And when it's not, they use the cable to take the power back and supply it back to the grid, uh, to the uh, the oil rigs, so they can, can de con con uh, decommission their very, very polluting generators, which are basically the same size as what we've got, a, yeah, the size we've got at our power station, about 25 megawatt. So there are uh, different things, ways to handle the technology, but you'd be looking for this to be an installation, and almost certainly, I would say, not 100% because it, we have to look at all the details, but the, the power would be handled offshore. It would not come to Guernsey directly. So, but what about the, the visual effect? I mean, if you look at Sark, nine miles away, uh, it's very clear on the horizon. You know, wind turbines as high as, as high as that, maybe higher. Um, very. Um, very great visual effect, and um, also, what about we, we need the uh, the power station to run as uh, as backup or uh, rotating stabilizers to stabilize if um, we lose the cable, or um, what about the cost of that running that? What, well, again, all that being included? well, again, you've got to remember we have a plan that's been approved by the states for well, remind me, Peter, was it five six hundred million? The electricity strategy. I think so. Capital overall over the period 1.72 billion. Yeah. For capital 690 million. 690 million. So we have a plan already presented by ENI, approved by the states, just looking at domestic demand, which includes a small wind farm offshore, uh, 
That's £690 million, and that's looking to reduce, have some renewables, have a mix, and reduce the uh, degree of backup that we have currently at the power station uh, uh, because we need to swap out generators. So we have a £690 million plan that we will have to pay for ourselves out of our own taxes that's already in place to deal with all those issues looking purely at domestic. That's nothing to do with this utility wind farm. That, that, just, that doesn't exist. The only difference is, of course, if we did have the utility wind farm, hopefully the revenue from that would pay for our domestic requirements or help contribute towards it. But it, it's being handled already separately. Yes, Peter. Carl, this gentleman's point about the environment. We all know estates members. People want houses unless they're built next door to them. So this would have a, an impact on the environment. Because if you're in daytime miles out and it's blinking, whatever the meters are, it is, we're going to be able to see them. Oh, you're going to be able to see them, without a doubt. Uh, we have seen them at these kind of distances, and they're not as obtrusive as I, th I, was, I, I was afraid they would be. And I suspect it's a bit like the contrails from jet aircraft. It wasn't until the Icelandic eruption that we realised we'd been looking at contrails all those years, and it wasn't until they were gone that we realised they had been there all the time. Uh, and I suspect uh, uh, there will be people who will just say, I do not want to see anything on the horizon other than the horizon. And there will be people who object on that basis. But I hope that enough of the population would see the advantages, the financial advantages, the environmental advantages, etc., of a project like this, and they would uh, buy in. Because, and also, we've got to take into account, I mean, it's, it's very understandable the comments you're making, and I've come across a number of people who've got a... A, a, a sort of a very sort of uh, environmentally focused and expert knowledge of the effects. So in both uh, Aberdeen and saint brieuc we looked carefully, we, we looked and measured the distances to see, you know, what I call the, the thumb sort of size, um, and sometimes disappeared on certain skies and, and everything else there. But there's the other side to it. Um, with it comes, there's a resilience for energy. With it comes the opportunity for infrastructure build, for example, any extended sort of mooring areas for the support ships could actually sort of double up six years later for cruise ships or larger vessels. There's going to be the change for opportunity for young people to work in a different sector, um, to work on the ships and also rebuild our relationship post-Brexit with France, um, help the possible win of Labour government to actually do their four and a half to six million homes they want to do. There's lots of knock-on effects and if we only look at the, uh, and sorry for maybe putting like that, the nimbyism aspect, we're going to miss on an opportunity which actually extends a lot further. So we have to take that bigger picture. It won't please everyone, but if it's when we're discussing with taxes, with uh, difficulty for employment or difficulty for, say, um, changing, because the finance sector will not remain, whatever anyone kind of feels, will not remain in the same way forever. Things are changing with the rules there. So we have to be versatile, and Guernsey has historically been versatile and adapted. So this is another opportunity. And again, just that reminder that the whole French coast and all the other aspects, they've, they've planned ahead to what they're going to do. And Cherbourg, for example, which used to be sort of a, a, a purely sort of commercial support now, is becoming like an Aberdeen <coughs> in the oil industry. It's, it's becoming actually um, a lot richer and creating lots of opportunity and meeting the, the CEO of the harbour authorities there saying what it's done for the area is incredible. Sorry. Yeah. Sorry. Uh, sorry, one quick point. Yes, oh, sorry. Um, you, you said, I think, uh, 280 pounds per megawatt hour for a tidal flow was... Uh, it, 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 it was, that was the CFD price. It's now down to about 220, I think. All right, but um, uh, there was a company, I've forgotten their name, gave a presentation in Alden something like three years ago um, uh, for us, Blanchard, with France, uh, between Albany, quoting 65 pounds a megawatt. Was it the Siemens uh, conversations or no? Uh, it, well, no. It was. Uh, I, in fact, I think they may have just got a subsidy from the French government to go ahead and build. That might be the uh, right the, for commercial projects that want to get a guarantee from the government. They are requesting the auction when the companies competitively bid. I'll build a, a, a tidal uh, a tidal uh, installation. They want. A, France has just provided a grant to a company, I believe, to build um, a test bed. This is only a test bed, it's not utility scale or, or a large. Uh, uh, and in fact, when we were in Sherbourg, we saw the building they were making them in.